On a remote corner of the Alaska Peninsula, brown bears at Brooks River and Katmai National Park are currently making their final preparations for winter hibernation. At nearly the same latitude, only more than 3,000 kilometers east, polar bears wait on the shore of Hudson Bay for the return of sea ice. Unlike the brown bears who are at their fattest point of the year, polar bears are at their skinniest. Polar bears and brown bears are closely related animals and they have a lot in common but many aspects of their lifestyles and their adaptations contrast sharply. Their habits and habitats also raise questions about their future in an era of human-driven climate change. As winter descends upon North America, we're witnessing a, two, a tale of two ecosystems on our bear cams on explore.org. And thanks for joining us today, everyone. My name is Mike Fitz. I'm the resident naturalist with explore.org. And to talk about the world of brown bears and polar bears and how their biology and lifestyles contrast with each other, I'm joined by Lisa McCall. She is the director of conservation outreach and a staff scientist at Polar Bears International. Elisa, thanks so much for being here today. It's always great for me to chat with my friends at, at Polar Bears and learn, learn more about uh, the, the amazing lives of those animals. Yeah, thanks so much for having me today, Mike. This is our favorite way to kick off polar bear season is uh, chatting with you on the tail end of brown bear season. And we're excited to partner once again with Polar Bears International to bring you live footage of polar bears along the western shore of Hudson Bay near Churchill, Manitoba. And the polar bear season has really just begun. So this is actually a live look in at a polar bear resting on a bed of kelp uh, from Tundra Buggy 1. So if you have questions about brown bears or polar bears for us, we're going to do our best to try to answer those during the broadcast today. So you can submit them in the comments and a helpful moderator from explore.org will be uh, sending those in our direction. We'll do our best to try to answer at least a few of those during the broadcast. And Elisa, I think we're going to have, you know, uh, you know, some new folks joining us for this live chat today who maybe haven't had the opportunity to watch the polar bear cams in the past. So maybe you can introduce us to uh, your organization, Polar Bears International. Yeah, absolutely. So Polar Bears International is the only nonprofit solely dedicated to the conservation of wild polar bears. And we work to protect polar bears and keep them in the Arctic long term through research, education, and advocacy. So we lead and support research projects across the Arctic, different types you'll hear a lot more about this fall. And then of course, education is a huge part of what we do. And that includes programs like this, the live chats with our wonderful partner, explore.org, and also our Tundra Connections webcast that we will be doing live throughout the fall, specifically aimed at teachers and classrooms, but anybody can join. We love talking about polar bears. We think that the more people connect with the bears and love the bears, the more they can help us make sure that those bears stay in the Arctic for a long, long time. And we just quickly, we do have polar bear camps set up throughout the Arctic. So we are in Churchill, Manitoba. I personally am not right now, but I will be in a few days. But our cams in Churchill, Manitoba, Canada, um, we have the one behind me, the Cape Cam. This one here is the buggy one cam, as Mike mentioned. So that's our mobile camera. And so that buggy can move around and find different polar bears on the tundra. We have a lodge north and a lodge south cam. And those cams are on the tundra buggy lodge where uh, tourist visitors can come stay on in the middle of the tundra, basically. And we also have out at Cape Churchill, which is way farther east. Uh, you can only really get there by helicopter or snowmobile. We have a couple cameras out there as well. And that camera, those ones run all year long. They're extra cool because we get to see extra wildlife, such as brown bears or grizzly bears occasionally. And recently there were Arctic wolves on the cam, as well as fun things like Arctic hares um, and lots of really cool birds. So just a little plug to check out the Churchill cams, especially if you're new to us. There's a lot of great stuff to see year round. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Katmai National Park in Alaska, in Churchill, in Manitoba, are located at nearly the same latitude. So that's about 45 degrees north of Earth's equator. Yet these places harbor much different habitats, and they provide bears with the means to survive in different ways. So I think, you know, during the beginning of our broadcast here, we're going to try to contrast the different habitats, and then we're going to move into the differences between uh, the different bears. Uh, and while Katmai National Park, let's start there because that's the area that I am most familiar with, uh, having worked there as a park ranger and then also uh, through my work with Explored at Oregon, the brown bear cams. You know, that place has plenty of tundra, glaciers at high elevations too. 
the region it itself experiences a pretty warm uh, temperate environment, relatively speaking. And that's due to the, the uh, close uh, proximity of the Pacific Ocean to the east and south and the Bering Sea to the west. In the lowland habitats, like you see here, they're thick with trees and tall shrubs. The landscape is also rich with an interconnected system of rivers and lakes, and these create perfect habitat for salmon. So in Katmai, uh, the central portion of the National Park where Brooks River is located, and that, that's Brooks River right there, uh, sockeye salmon are the most abundant salmon species. They're a high calorie food for brown bears, and this allows bears in Katmai to live at very high densities. More than 100 individual bears have been identified using that three kilometer long Brooks River during summertime. And in Katmai, bears are found across the landscape but they're especially concentrated in areas where they can find abundant food, like on the Pacific coast of the park or along salmon streams in the interior, places like Brooks River. Uh, but so that's a, just a basic overview of the habitat that bears experience in Katmai. Elisa, it's very different for bears in the Western Hudson Bay area, even though, again, this is at the, the same latitude as Katmai. Yes, Mike, it's very different for the polar bears, especially in Churchill. And in fact, right now where we're seeing them, it's not where they want to be. We don't even really consider this their kind of regular desired habitat. Polar bears are an ice bear. Uh, they are adapted to live out on Arctic sea ice. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But these particular bears, of course, they live on the coast of Hudson Bay. And Hudson Bay has seasonal sea ice. So during the summer, it melts away, and then during the winter, it freezes up. And as soon as this ice is frozen up, and viewers will see this in the fall, as soon as there's enough ice, these polar bears are gone. But until then, they are waiting, and they don't have access to their food source seals. And that's what the sea ice is for, truly. It gives them access to their main food source, the blubber that the seals have. So right now, without the sea ice, the polar bears are kind of just hanging out. So it's very different than Katmai. They don't have a food source right now that they're gathering around. Why we are seeing them start to congregate a little bit is simply because they know the temperatures are cooling down now. The ice will be coming in the next month or two. So they're slowly starting to move toward the coast. So we do see higher concentrations of polar bears uh, than other times of the year right now along the coast, though still very different than Katmai. And they're not gonna be eating much, but we will see them definitely be eating some of the kelp or seaweed. Uh, the cameras have caught a polar bear eating a vole before. Occasionally they find another snack on the coast. Um, but right now they're they're still pretty spread out. If, if we were to look at where all the polar bears are right now across Manitoba and the coast, we would see a lot more of them spread out north and south. Uh, some inland still, some on the coast already. Um, very, very different distribution patterns than those brown bears in Katmai, absolutely. And these are closely related animals from an evolutionary mm -hmm. perspective. Um, and they, but you know, even given that, I mean, they display considerable differences in their appearance and their diet and their habitat. So let's take a few moments to uh, discuss what defines the two bear species. Uh, maybe the mm -hmm. obvious thing to start with is their appearance. Uh, for brown bears, brown bears are, they're aptly named. Their fur is often plain brown, but mm -hmm. it also ranges from, you know, blonde to dark brown. It can change with the season as well. A lot of times in early summer, uh, bear fur, brown bear fur is kind of lighter in color. It seems to kind of like um, lose some of its pigments as it ages. Uh, but when they shed that fur and they grow new fur in, it's often, you know, quite dark and brown color. Uh, this doesn't, it, it, you know, I don't, know how much camouflage it provides them, although I'm sure it provides them some <laughs> camouflage, but it's really not specialized for their habitat overall. Uh, and that I think is a big difference between a, a brown bear and a, a polar bear, Elisa. Absolutely. So polar bears look white to us and that helps them blend into the sea ice. When they're out hunting those seals, the white fur probably does help them camouflage on the ice and helps them sneak up on seals a little bit. And the polar bear fur is quite different than the brown bear fur. So there's a good up close shot of it. First of all, polar bear fur is actually transparent. So it looks white to our eyes, but it's clear if you get up really close and look at it under a microscope. It's also hollow. So that helps warm air get trapped inside the fur and keep those polar bears warm. They also have two layers. I do have a piece of fur right here. It's a little hard to see, but there's, there's two layers of fur. There's a short, short dense layer right next to the skin and we can think of that like a thick woolly sweater and then these longer hairs over top 
that's kind of like the polar bear's built-in rain jacket. So that's going to wick the moisture away, these longer hairs. And adult males have even another type of hair on the back of their forearms. They grow very long hairs. And we think that maybe the lady polar bears like the look of those long hairs. But one interesting thing about those hairs, or any hair, including human hair, is that we can, of course, study hair and look at toxins, look at diet. We can learn a lot from hair. And so if we can pull a very long hair from an adult male, then we can get a really long time series of what that bear is going through in terms of diet, getting on the ice, off the ice, what sort of pollutants might be in its system. So we can learn a lot about polar bear hair and polar bear hair is very cool and pretty different from brown bear hair. Yeah, and that's actually, uh, you know, speaking of like the diet and how hair can be utilized, mm -hmm. Uh, for the study of that, uh, there have been uh, scientists utilizing those same techniques in brown bears as well to look at, uh, you know, mm -hmm. how much salmon brown bears eat in certain parts of, of North America throughout mm -hmm. the summertime, looking at, um, you know, how much mercury they might be, you know, uh, yeah. ingesting through salmon, for instance. So yeah, there's a lot of, I think, uh, possibilities uh, for further study when you're looking at brown bear and, and polar bear fur. And, and Lisa, we did have a question coming in about polar bear fur. Uh, oh, great. Somebody wrote and wondered, do polar bears shed their fur like brown bears? Yes, yeah, so polar bears do have a spring molt season where they do shed a lot of their uh, fur. Ab absolutely, they kind of get clean, cleaned off in the spring. So we, this is part of the basis. We'll talk more about it this fall, but we have a research project we call Burr on Fur. We're working on some stick on tracking devices to polar bear fur. And part of the idea is that we would stick this device onto the polar bear's fur and then it would naturally molt it off every spring and it would just fall off. So uh, yeah, it, it's a really interesting thing. We actually, there's also a PhD student, Jenny Stern, working at the University of Washington right now, getting a deep dive into all sorts of polar bear hair questions that are teaching us a lot. And so maybe we'll know more by next year even. All right, well, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and, you know, polar bears, they uh, they have a pretty specialized diet that we'll get to in just, just a moment, because I think that is just a tremendous difference between the two animals as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Katmai's bears, they're highly reliant on salmon. If you've been watching the bear cams in Katmai, you've seen that. You know, there's still bears utilizing the river right now, looking for the last of the spawning salmon. But overall, brown bears are generalist omnivores. They're, they are like us in that sense. They'll eat a wide variety of plant and animal foods, just about anything that they can put in their mouth and digest, they're going to try to eat. Uh, in fact, most brown bear populations in North America and in Asia and Europe as well, they're largely vegetarian. So Katmai's bears are a little unique in the sense that they have a lot more um, meat and, and primarily fat from salmon in their diet. That's not available to a lot of other bears. Uh, but they will still eat uh, a lot of sedge, they'll eat a lot of grass, they'll eat a lot of herbaceous plants, they'll eat a lot of berries too. And in the Rocky Mountains, uh, the yearly diet of many grizzly bears is more than 90% plants. So when you're looking at a bear fishing at Brooks Falls, catching salmon, realize that that's a, uh, you know, a somewhat unique thing that a lot of bears and uh, brown bears across the world don't have the opportunity for. It happens in coastal North America. It happens in parts of coastal Asia, like the Kamchatka region. But, you know, most brown bears are surviving largely off of, of a plant-based diet. And they're adapted to do that uh, because they're, they, they don't necessarily have a, like a chambered stomach or other specialized organs to help them digest plant matter plant matter, you know, if you were to compare them to other members of the carnivore family, like a lynx, for example, but they do have a slightly elongated uh, intestine to help them digest and maybe pull energy from plant matter a bit easier um, than other bear um, or other carnivore species. Uh, so again, they are generalist omnivores overall, and that really contrasts, Elisa, with polar bears, which are adapted for a much more uh, specialized diet. Absolutely. So polar bears are one of the most specialized bears. Uh, they are the most carnivorous bear. And we also talk about them as being a lipovore, which I don't know if it's technically a thing, but lipovore basically meaning um, wanting to eat fat all the time. So polar bears number one diet source is the blubber on seals. So they use the sea ice to access seals. They head out on the ice. They either still hunt, they wait patiently by a seal hole for a seal to come up for air, or they will stalk, sneakily stalk a, a seal like this who's resting on the ice. 
And polar bears, if they're quite hungry, they will eat the entire seal. If it is, for example, the spring where there's abundant food, a polar bear might simply strip a seal of its blubber, leaving the meat and move on to the next hunt just to get that fat. Polar bears have a, a super, super high conversion rate of dietary fat to body fat. So the vast majority of the fat, the blubber they consume gets turned right into fat on their bodies. It's much more efficient than our bodies, humans, luckily. And polar bears have been studied uh, for how they can eat so much fat and not have it impact their heart at all. In fact, the healthiest bears are the fattest bears. One of the important reasons they have to get so fat or try to get so fat is because polar bears do generally go through these cycles of feasting and fasting. We see that particularly in Hudson Bay right now. These polar bears are nearing the end of their fast. They haven't really eaten all summer. Again, no seals to eat. Uh, so they've been living off of that body fat that they built up all winter while hunting. So it's really important that they come off the sea ice being fat so that they can go months without eating. I will say though, of course, polar bears are still a bear. So they will eat other things when they're quite hungry. Like I mentioned before, they will eat seaweed. Um, they will scavenge on whatever they can find. They will eat goose eggs in the summer. They will go after people's garbage in certain areas of the Arctic. So that's to fill their tummies. That's not to actually provide any dietary nutrition. Polar bears, in fact, digest fruits and vegetables the least well of any bear species. So it takes a lot more energy for polar bears to digest uh, that kind of roughage food compared to a brown bear. So they really do need access to seals, access to fat. That's the name of the game. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't actually know that they couldn't really digest, um, you know, sugary foods uh, very well, because that's something that brown bears are exceptionally good at. Fat, they're, they're really good mm -hmm. at digesting fat, um, a, 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 like a polar bear, but they're also really, really good at digesting sugar. So um, that's, yeah, that is a big difference. And I, I did not know that polar bears had a, a, a challenge with those sorts of things. So berries, maybe not the best um, polar bear food overall. And I think you can also see how, um, you know, polar bears are adapted to a different diet than, than brown bears um, in their teeth. Brown bears have slightly flattened molars, um, not as much as like a, a black American black bear, which, um, it, it, which largely live on, on plants, you know, throughout their range. Um, but they do have slightly flattened molars to help them to kind of chew vegetation. And, and process, um, you know, berries when they're when they're munching on them. But the the teeth of polar bears, as I understand it, at least, are very different too. Absolutely, for polar bears, even their molars are a lot sharper. They're really made for shearing fat and meat, and their front teeth are, of course, crazy, crazy sharp. And they've got a little gap between their front sharp teeth and their back molars, just perfectly to fit a seal head and pull the seal. Uh, out of the water there. So all the polar bear's teeth are very much made for fat and meat. Um, actually, and polar bears don't even digest protein nearly as well as they digest fat. So another clue about how much they need to eat blubber. And also polar bear jaws are not quite as strong as brown bear jaws. Brown bears have stronger jaws and stronger muscles to chew because brown bears are chewing a lot and polar bears in a perfect world, their diet's pretty squishy. Uh, so their teeth are for shearing, ripping, eating meat, not so much for chewing that vegetation. And I wanna talk more about the habitats of these different bears uh, in just a second here, but there was a question that came in uh, about the different types of bears in North America. And this is something maybe I should clarify mm -hmm. for everybody. It's a good question because somebody wrote in, we usually refer to black bears and grizzlies in Canada. And then it's like question mark brown bears. Uh, are they what we call black bears or more akin to grizzlies? And so I should say that brown bears and grizzly bears are the same species. So there are different species than polar bears, they're just, but they're uh, the two common names for the same species. So their scientific name is Ursus arctos. And that's basically just Greek and Latin for, uh, for brown <laughs> or for bear. Um, so yeah, brown and grizzly bears are the same species. Just depends on where you are in North America, what you want to call them. In general, uh, if you're along the the northwest coast of North America, whether that's like in the Katmai region on the Alaska Peninsula or going down into British Columbia, for instance, if you're looking at an Ursus arctos there, you're looking, people are generally going to call them brown bears. But again, they're the same species. So if you went to the Katmai and you're like, hey, that's a grizzly bear, you know, no one really should technically give you a hard time about it. And if they do, tell them that I told them that you shouldn't, they, they shouldn't do that. Um, but let's get back to the habitat. Uh, 
here, you know, because we have these physical adaptations that separate the bears, but the, the habitat is also very, very different as well. Uh, brown bears, they occupy diverse terrestrial habitats. Um, and in North America, prior to European colonization, brown bears lived everywhere from the Arctic tundra to coastal California, to the mid-continental prairies and the deserts of what we now call, uh, you know, the Southwest US and Northern Mexico. And one way that brown bears are adapted to living in these places is the shape of their claws. Their front claws are several inches long uh, and they're adapted to really act as excavators. They're kind of like an all-purpose tool. This helps them to not only grip prey if they need to, but it also helps them dig uh, tubers and roots and underground truffles. If they're hunting ground squirrels, for instance, in Katmai, they might be able to dig them up very easily using those big bucket-shaped claws. Their, cars are, their, their claws, I should um, say, aren't that great for climbing trees, but they are just a great all-around tool for getting at foods that reside under the soil surface. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that struck me, Elisa, the, the one time that I was able to travel to um, Churchill and see polar bears myself, is just how different the polar bear claws are. They're often hidden underneath those big furry paws. You can't see them very well uh, from a distance. But polar bear claws, again, another specialized adaptation of those amazing animals. Definitely. And claws for the ice look a lot different than claws for the land. So the polar bear claw is a, a lot shorter, first of all, and it's very, very thick and very curved and sharp. So these claws are much more for traction on sea ice and, of course, grabbing slippery seals out of the ocean. So you can see there on the left, we have the brown bear claw and on the right, we have the polar bear claw. So you can look at the different functionalities of those claws. As Mike was saying, the excavator claw, good for digging stuff up. And then on the right, the sharp claw, good for traction and poking into uh, seals, basically. You can imagine slippery seals are hard uh, to get when they're trying to escape under the water. So polar bears need to have those, those sharp claws. And their feet are actually quite interesting as well. The bottom pads of polar bear feet are covered with little bumps we call papillae and they're a little bit sticky so they give the polar bears some traction on that sea ice and in fact winter tire companies have looked at the polar bear paws for inspiration to improve their winter tires make them more grippy so polar bear is absolutely an ice bear as all these different adaptations keep showing and as we look at our bear waking up from or this polar bear waking up <laughs> from a nap on the tundra you know, uh, bears are doing, a, the, the polar bears are doing a lot of resting at this time of the year. As you mm -hmm. mentioned, they're waiting for the return of sea ice. And in Katmai, the bears, a lot of them, their metabolism is slowing down at this time of the year uh, because they are going to be experiencing hibernation uh, very soon. And that's the event that brown bears have been spending months preparing for. That's why they, they get so fat in uh, throughout the summertime because during winter, they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't urinate, or, and they don't defecate. They go to dens. They survive basically solely on their body fat at that time of the year. Um, they keep their muscles healthy. They keep their bones healthy at this time of the year. It's really remarkable what a brown bear can do inside of its den. And, uh, but they need body fat to do that. Uh, winter is also the time of the year when mother brown bears give birth to cubs. And that's usually in uh, midwinter, right around the end of January or early uh, February. Elisa, you were mentioning, though, about how polar bears are sea ice specialists. You know, they're going to be out on the sea ice in the wintertime. Uh, and that's, um, you know, kind of a big difference between what brown bears experience and what polar bears experience. We also got a few questions about that um, at the beginning of our, our conversation today. And this is a good time, I think, to bring them up. Somebody was wondering, where do polar bears den? And somebody else was wondering, do polar bears hibernate? Where do they go? Uh, so you can tell us maybe a little bit about the 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 denning sort of uh you know natural history of polar bears which isn't quite the same as what brown bears experience right polar bears are almost the inverse of brown bears uh when it comes to hibernation so we used to think because again polar bears and brown bears are related and brown bears have this period of hibernation we thought well polar bears generally polar bears they they don't hibernate males don't hibernate um, females with cubs don't hibernate. So maybe in the summer at this time of year, like this polar bear here, maybe they have some sort of metabolic change that is helping them conserve energy. And there's been a few fabulous physiological studies in the last decade really trying to get at how polar bears use their energy at different times of years. And the conclusion was 
they absolutely do not have, have that mechanism. They're not conserving energy, uh, even at the time where they don't have access to their food. So polar bears don't have a method of hibernation. So really their method is just to sleep a lot, which is what we see at this time of the year and what we see with this guy. They're conserving their energy simply by resting. Um, there's no changes in their body. And these studies did show polar bears are actually using more energy than we had estimated they were. They need a lot of energy to live out on that sea ice, which you can imagine the sea ice is a constantly moving habitat. They're like walking on a treadmill all the time. It's shifting and moving and they're always having to be on the lookout for new food. So it's a big deal. When it comes to denning, so those are, the one type of polar bear that we do see enter dens is of course pregnant females. So pregnant females will enter dens. Their bodies do go through some changes to help them conserve energy and then give birth. Um, so the timeline for that, we'll look at the Churchill bears because it varies a little across the Arctic. But when female polar bears who are pregnant come off the ice in about July every year, they're going to enter their dens around this time of the year. Maybe some have already, maybe some are about to. And they will give birth about late December or so. We assign all cubs a birthday of January 1st, just to make it easier for us. And then they will stay in that den until February or March. The mother will emerge from her den with those cubs and head straight to the sea ice um, at about the time the seals are pupping so that there's a lot of abundant food to be had. Now, if you do the math on that, that's eight months without eating for those female polar bears. So again, you can see why they really need to get fat before they come onto land. Now, where polar bears then, again, it varies across the Arctic. A lot of polar bears um, do den on land around the Arctic. Of course, in the Churchill area and Hudson Bay, they have to den on land because there's no sea ice. So we see the polar bears, they dig their dens into peat, it's called. And this is an area where dens do get reused. So Wapusk National Park is the park along the coast of Manitoba, where a lot of the polar bears spend their summers and where most of the denning happens. So it's a very important national park. Uh, helping protect the denning habitat of polar bears. We often see um, dens concentrated along riverbanks, which is pretty neat, but they can kind of be anywhere. Um, we're, we're not too sure if the like cubs, when they grow up, they come back to the same den, but we know they come back to roughly the same area. Polar bears do have something we call site fidelity. So they like to go away and then come back generally to where they were born. They like that. Other parts of the Arctic, um, Again, very, I've said that a few times, but some polar bears do den on Arctic sea ice, um, that we see that in the higher Arctic. So they'll dig sea ice dens and then emerge with their cubs. We have seen a shift. So for example, in the Southern Beaufort Sea off Alaska, uh, there used to be more denning on Arctic sea ice. And now we're seeing an increase in the bears choosing to den on land. And that's because that sea ice is changing so much and retreating so far from land that more polar bears are having to make different decisions with the changes. So denning behavior is different across the Arctic. They generally will dig dens um, in the earth, especially in Manitoba, they have to. And it's a really, really interesting part of the polar bear's life and the only polar bears that kind of hibernate. And I, I should note too uh, that Brown bears also show fidelity towards their denning areas. Cool. Um, there's been some studies, uh, I think, on Kodiak Island that found that bears will go back not to the same den site because the soils in that in the in that region don't necessarily allow for you know dens to survive more than a year. But they'll go back to the same area. They'll be like, I kind of know this is a spot where I survived last winter, or maybe my mom showed me when I was a young cub. Uh, because sometimes the denning sites will be like way beyond like their normal summer home range. So it might have been something that they learned when they were very young. Uh, but that's, uh, you know, maybe another uh, aspect of the similarities before or between brown and polar bears. Uh, and Alisa, there was a related... Like, Go ahead. Oh, sorry, just quick. I just wanted to add the reason that polar bears can reuse those dens is because it's in the permafrost, which I didn't mention. So the permanently frozen tundra is why those dens kind of survive. But we are seeing changes with that as the permafrost thaws across the Arctic. So clarification. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> hey, no problem. It's important clarification. Uh, a related question, though, uh, to sort of like the, the denning period of of polar bears, it has to do with what brown bears experience before they go into their dens. Um, in, in late summer and early fall, brown bears experience a, a time of, uh, a, or an annual phase, a physiological phase called hyperphagia, which basically means, uh, literally it means excessive eating, but it's not excessive for the bears themselves. It's a purposeful adaptation that 
where their bodies are prior prioritizing eating over other life tasks, for instance. So they don't feel full, the mechanisms that would, the hormones that would normally tell their brain, hey, you know, you need to stop eating, your belly is full at this moment in time. In a brown bear that's, uh, that's experiencing hyperphagia, those things are essentially shut off. Um, so the, a bear's brain becomes resistant to those mechanisms. And they just feel this urge, this overwhelming urge to eat and eat and eat. And, and usually that's in late summer and early fall. Uh, but somebody was wondering, Elisa, do brown bear, or excuse me, do polar bears experience hyperphagia like uh, brown bears? And when would that, uh, as a follow-up question that I have, what time of the year would that be for them? Yeah, absolutely. As you said, it's a very important time of the year. So when I mentioned earlier that uh, female polar bears who have young cubs would emerge from their dens in around March to try to time up when, when the seals are pupping, that is when polar bears generally start their hyperphagia period. It's about April, late March, April. It's after the seals have pupped. Um, so there's a lot of seal babies and the seal babies have become a little bit plump. So seal babies have been feeding for maybe about six weeks. They're nice and plump, but they're still very naive, not super agile or smart. And this is amazing feeding opportunities for polar bears. And polar bears will gorge themselves on seals at that time of the year, try to gain as much fat as possible. They can eat over 100 pounds of blubber at one sitting, no problem. Um, they just, they will eat anything they can. Like you said, I like to call it putting their fat pants on. It's that time of the year. And they, again, need to eat as much as they can so that um, they can last through the upcoming summer with less food. So yeah, it's neat that they both have these different phases, but just at different times of the year. And going back to you, know, just a, a last thought about sort of like hibernation in brown bears is, and, and how that relates to polar bears. Interestingly, and this is something that I don't know, for some reason I think about all the time when, when I'm preparing, you know, for, our, you know, the, this program, is that how brown bears aren't obligate hibernators, meaning they do not have to hibernate if they have access to enough food. So uh, on like Kodiak Island, for instance, near Katmai, there's always like a few bears that are wandering around the landscape, although they're not like fully active, like they would be in uh, the in the, in the summertime. They're pretty lethargic. Uh, but you know, in we're in coastal California, before bears were sort of uh, you know extirpated from that area, you can imagine that hey, wintertime in parts of California would have been a pretty good time of the year for a brown bear to be active. And I think since polar bears evolved from brown bears, they may have retained that ability to you know, just remain uh, active year round. And, and this, in my opinion, may have allowed polar bears to sort of exploit those novel feeding opportunities out on sea ice. There was probably some population of brown bears sometime in the past, maybe multiple populations that were just like, hey, there are all these seals laying out in the ice. Why do I have to, <laughs> why do I have to go to a den? I can just go out there and get fat. And, and, um, and then, you know, and eventually we wound up with polar bears. That's just um, something that I speculate about, but I, I think that's a kind of a fascinating aspect of a brown bear life that sort of relates to, mm -hmm. um, to polar bears. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think the the current understanding that we still have a lot to learn about how that split from polar bears and brown bears happened, but the current understanding is that polar bears probably first split from a population of Alaskan brown bears, those ABC islands there. It, and your theory seems to make a lot of sense. Um, and the bears that were more successful hunting seals and getting that extra food, you know, selected for lighter fur and all those, those different adaptations. So yeah, pretty interesting how they're so close yet so far. <laughs> and uh let's talk about family life family life now for um you know brown and, and polar bears let's talk about polar bears maybe first because you were just talking about mother bears and their dens um and you know how mother bears need to for mother polar bears go in sometimes eight months without eating which is just remarkable mm -hmm. and they're raising their cubs yeah we did have some some questions about cubs and family life um and before we get to from our audience before we get to those though um i'm wondering about how long um, a mother polar bear will care for her cubs. So what is that family like, family life like for them and how long are they together? The cubs will stay with the mom for about two and a half years. So when cubs are first born, that first year of their life, we call them a cub of the year, sometimes called a koi uh, for an abbreviation. The second year of their life, we call them a yearling. So they're over a year old. And then after they hit two, um we well they're called a two-year-old <laughs> but they'll be with their mom um probably until the spring of that year until she decides to get another mate or a mate decides um that she's 
his next mate and the Cubs and their mom separate at that time. So two and a half years is not a lot of time to learn how to be a polar bear out there. Um, when the Cubs are at that age, when they split from their mom, then they're called a sub-adult until they're five years old, at which time we consider them an adult. And that sub-adult phase is arguably one of the hardest of a polar bear's life. Um, they're not very big yet. They're not very experienced. Those are the bears that often kind of get themselves into trouble. Um, but, you know, a lot of bears do reach reach that five years of age and go on to be successful, which I'm always, I'm just always in awe of these polar bears and the life they live on that sea ice. It is just so harsh and they are just really incredible animals for making a living out there. And that largely mirrors what uh, we have with brown bear families as well. So mother brown bears, especially in Katmai National Park, they'll keep their cubs for two to three years. They'll go into the dens with them one more time. They'll, they'll hibernate together as a family. Then when they come out of the springtime, they'll hang out for a while and then they'll split generally at the beginning of a bear's third or fourth summer. And those sub-adult years can be particularly hard for those young brown bears because no longer you know, do you have mom's protection anymore. You've got to figure things out on your own. So hopefully those young bears absorbed their mother's lessons and everything that she taught them about where to find food and when that food is available for them. But you're also relegated to like the bottom of the bear hierarchy. So you don't have access to the good fishing spots at Brooks Falls like you did when you were with your mother and you had that bodyguard at your side. With the adaptations though that brown bears have for eating vegetation, those young bears can actually gain weight off of you know sedge and grasses a lot easier than the larger mm. bears. So even if they're not eating a lot of salmon, they can still munch on like uh, sedges in early summer. They can go feed on berries in late summer and make a living uh, fairly fairly easily. So that's maybe one difference again between the brown bears and the polar bears, uh, as far as like what young bears can take advantage of as far as food opportunities um, go. Um, uh, before we get off the topic of, of uh, bear families though, Elisa, we did have a question from somebody who says they are four years old. So thanks. We all, we all often really, you know, love it when young people are watching and learning about uh, bears here on explore.org. Somebody was wondering, do cubs that were born, that were just born go into water with their mothers? So what is that, that sort of that, that those first few weeks of life like for a, a young polar bear, Elisa, when they're, when they're, when they get out of the den? That's a really good question. So um, to back up a bit, so I talked about polar bear fur earlier and how it keeps the polar bear so nice and warm. But when that fur gets wet, it doesn't help keep the polar bear warm very well. Um, so polar bears really need a lot of body fat to keep warm in the water because they are good swimmers when they're adults. But when they're little babies, they don't have much body fat yet. So moms really try to make sure that their babies don't have to swim in the water because it can be dangerous for them. If they absolutely do have to get in the water for some reason, when the cubs are just little and they're first born, the cub will probably catch a ride on its mom's back. So mommy can kind of give a piggyback ride to her cubs to swim across um, some open water if they need to. But generally moms with the little cubs, uh, when they do get out on the sea ice, they don't tend to go very far. Mom is kind of staying close-ish to the coast, avoiding open water, avoiding big males, and just keeping your cubs safe um, and as warm as possible out there on the sea ice. So that's a really good question. The, the bigger the cubs get, the better they can swim. But even for adults, swimming is really hard in the Arctic Ocean. So walking is preferable when possible. We often see brown bear cubs, young brown bear cubs avoid water if they're mm -hmm. given a choice. And I think it's maybe for the same reasons, you know, they're just not that yeah. good at swimming. Uh, they're, they're small, so maybe they get cold a lot easier. They become more comfortable in the water as they age and they gain, you know, more, more body mass. But yeah, it's hard for those young bears. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, before we can have young bears on the landscape, you know, males and females have to find each other and, and they have to mate. We did have um, some questions a little bit about the mating season here. Um, with 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 brown bears um again as we're looking at a live live uh, look here at a polar bear wandering on the shore of hudson bay um in manitoba with with brown bears the mating season is in late spring that's usually when it when it peaks and there's you know often not a lot of you know really great food on the landscape for uh for brown bears at that time of the year so for some bears it's not really interfering with their ability to get fat uh, but somebody was wondering about polar bears on sea ice. You know, they're out there, they're looking for seals. Um, and 
you know, sometimes mother bears have cubs with them. So how do polar bears, this person writes, how do they meet each other for mating when they're spread over such a vast area? Yeah, I think it's hard, <laughs> uh, especially when the CA, again, the CA is moving all the time and how do you find the right mate? So polar bears very much rely on their sense of smell to find each other on the sea ice and find a mate on the sea ice. When a female is ready to mate, she will excrete a smell from her paws. So the super cool sticky paws I mentioned earlier, they become smelly and she's got glands that put down a pheromone in her paw print. So as she walks across the sea ice, she's leaving a scent trail that males can pick up. And if a male finds a good smelling set of footprints, uh, he's going to follow her for as long as he can to try to find her on that sea ice. So they also do mate in about late spring, April, May, June, um, finding each other out there through smell. And then the female, if, if they do mate, she actually doesn't technically get pregnant right away. So she might have a, a fertilized embryo in there, but it does not implant yet. So they have delayed implantation. And that's because she needs to be so fat in order to sustain a pregnancy and go through this long period in the den that her body's gonna wait for a few more months to see how fat she gets first in the spring. And then in the summer, if she's healthy enough, then implantation will happen and she'll be pregnant and she'll go into a den. If she never gets fat enough or not healthy enough, then her body will just flush her system and she'll start again next spring. We know polar bears need to be Female polar bears need to be at least 420 pounds. That's the lowest we know of to have a, su a successful pregnancy. Um, so her body's really kind of hedging its bets uh, with mating and all that. So I think that's a really interesting thing about polar bears as well. But to find each other, the answer is smelly feet. <laughs> and that's a lot of what brown bears do as well. Um, you know, that sort of natural history aspect of polar bears mirrors what brown bears experience too yeah so males are yeah. using their sense of smell to try to find females on the landscape who may be um, receptive mm -hmm. to mating and a lot of people do wonder about you know the the, the time of the year when that happens it can, if it's dangerous for cubs it can be dangerous for brown bear cubs um, you know sometimes male bears will kill um, will kill cubs during the mating season and outside of the mating season so it happens at different times of the year. It's certainly not restricted to one time of the year. But somebody did write in, Elisa, was wondering, do male polar bears attack cubs from another litter like brown bears might do? It does happen, yes. Um, it's not, not all male polar bears would do that. Um, you know, we've seen when there's been a cub wandering around and a lot of males don't pay it any attention. And then a particular male, maybe he's extra hungry or extra grumpy. Um, but he might choose to go after that cub. So it does happen. It's not super common. It's not like a built-in automatic mechanism that males have, uh, but some males will at some times go after cubs, uh, potentially. It, depending on the year, it could either, it could be for food if they're really, really hungry, or in the spring, it could be uh, to try to mate with the mother. Yeah, and that's another, I think, thing that polar bears and brown bears have in common. It's, it's very circumstantial when it happens. It's not yeah. like every male brown bear is out there on the landscape you know, looking to target cubs. It seems like uh, from those, those moments when I've, you know, witnessed or we've seen it on like the brown bear cams, it is, is very circumstantial, but it does happen. And that's one reason why mother bears are so protective of their offspring. And they'll mm -hmm. often avoid areas where they know other big bears are around because they just like, you know what, it's not worth the risk. I want to keep my cub safe and I'm going to do it over here rather than over there. Yep, definitely. Uh, let's, uh, you know, talk about the, you know, the, the, the relatedness between the two bears. We've been hinting at this, you know, throughout, you know, our talks <laughs> so far today, um, but we haven't really addressed that question specifically. And it's one of the more common questions that we get when we're talking about brown bears and polar bears. Uh, you know, people do wonder how closely related are these two species? And we were actually talking before the program, Elisa, about this. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty among scientists about this. But we do know that brown bears and and polar bears are closely related. What can you what can you share? Yeah, so there yeah, there's some different um, kind of opinions that we still have a lot to learn from the genetic record. It's hard to find polar bear fossils because a lot of them are at the bottom of the ocean. But from what we do know, polar bears are probably at least 150,000 years old as a species, and they absolutely split off from brown bears and like I mentioned, probably from Alaskan brown bears. So though they're very different, as we've been talking about today, they're also very similar. And in fact, they're still so closely related, 
on the bear family tree that they can and have hybridized. So there have been um, examples of growler bears, grizzly polar bears up in the Canadian high Arctic. There were a few cases spotted and a lot of uh, hullabaloo of questions about what was going on. And after uh, more genetic research, uh, it was found out that there was one female polar bear who on different occasions mated with two different grizzly males and had a litter with each of those males. And then those cubs also mated with brown bears. So we had half hybrids and then quarter polar bear, three quarter brown bear hybrids. Um, so it was kind of just from one female. So they, there weren't a ton of them. And the hybrids were, so one thing what to note is that the hybrids could then go on to mate. And a lot of hybrids in the wild are infertile, but these hybrids were fertile and went on to have cubs. So that's interesting. But also interesting is that the hybrids themselves were not super fit. So we've been talking today about how specialized polar bears are for sea ice and how grizzly bears, though they're generalists in their diet and things like that, they're really a terrestrial bear. So now when you have a bit of both, that bear is not really well suited for either environment. So um, there were kind of some questions like, is this the next super bear species? And it's really like, no, this, this bear isn't um, very well suited for either environment. And in fact, from anecdotes from people that live in the north, the, the bears tended to be quite aggressive. Um, and that might have been a function of them being hungry or just ill fit or something. So not sure. Um, at this point, we don't know of any hybrids still in the wild. We're sure it does happen occasionally. And it probably has always happened to some extent throughout these two species histories because they are closely related. There's only really a few areas in the world that polar bear females, when they're ready to mate, would overlap with uh, grizzly males. So we're never we're more than likely, very likely, never going to see this become a widespread phenomenon. This is not um, the answer to climate change for polar bears. This is not the beginning of a brand new super species. It's kind of just a circumstantial thing that occasionally happens in the wild. And it's interesting, um, but it's not going to impact either species in, in the long term. It's also important to note, too, that there have been situations where brown and polar bears have mingled on land during past right? yep. climatic changes like the end of the last ice age for instance it happened in southeast alaska and we don't have like some some hybrid polar bear brown bear population there we have polar bear genes in brown bears populations like in southeast alaska but it's not like there's some sort of special bear there that's adapted to sea ice and on land or some sort of weird hybrid so uh yeah it's a, i think it's a a fascinating thing to study and learn more about uh, because, you know, contact between polar and brown bears is becoming increasingly common uh, as, you know, the climate continues to warm. And with the, the last few minutes we have in our, our, our program here to, today, at least, I think that's a good, good time to talk about bear conservation, uh, specifically with um, polar bear conservation. You know, this year, mm -hmm. our Arctic sea ice, it's once again well below 20th century averages. Um, and across, you know, the 44 years of satellite records, the 16 lowest minimum sea ice records for the Arctic have occurred during the past 16 years. So it's definitely a worrisome trend overall. Uh, can you talk uh, again just about how important sea ice is for polar bears and what does reduced sea ice cover, uh, how does that affect them? Yeah, so sea ice is everything for polar bears. Without sea ice, there are no polar bears. So that is um, something that we always kind of keep in our hearts. But when we look at polar bears across the Arctic, it is important to know there are areas of the Arctic where the sea ice hasn't changed a lot yet. And some polar bear populations are doing well and they're stable. Um, there's a couple even still increasing rebounding from over harvest in the past. But we do know that as we lose Arctic sea ice, we will see changes in polar bear populations. And that's based on decades of study and particularly these Churchill polar bears. These polar bears in western Hudson Bay, where the cams are and where we are right now, these polar bears are some of the best studied in the world. And we know with over 40 years of data that as the sea ice has changed, so has the population. So the population has declined um, from about over 1,200 animals to closer to 800 now in the last couple decades, few decades. Uh, the polar bears are smaller than they used to be. They're having fewer cubs. And it really is a result. If you don't have as much sea ice, you don't have as much food. And when you have less nutrition in your body, your body sees changes. And this impacts any wildlife species over time. 
Um, so we've also seen these same things kind of play out in the southern Beaufort Sea. Changes in sea ice have led to a decline in population and changes in the polar bears. So we can kind of think of these bears as the fat white hairy canaries in the coal mine. And they're teaching us lessons about what is going to happen as the Arctic continues to warm. And if we do nothing about the Arctic warming, then we could lose you know, two thirds of the world's polar bears by the end of the century. If we do something, if we act now and we have a widespread change to more renewable energies moving away from fossil fuels, we know we can keep sea ice in the Arctic in many places in the Arctic and we can keep polar bears on that sea ice. Uh, we are locked in for some major changes, particularly in Hudson Bay. Um, but th this is part of the reason we advocate, we educate, we research, we know the polar bears are coming up on major changes, and we know we do have some power with the decisions we make today to ensure that they stay in the Arctic. And of course, it impacts us as well. Um, all these climate effects, it's not only about polar bears. Our future is so intertwined with the polar bears. So it's also about what's best for people. And that's why we talk about switching to more solar power, more wind, water, all, all those good things. Um, it's not only for the polar bears, it's for us too. But we, we do know, yeah, po polar bears are going through it, but there's, there's good news stories as well. Um, but we do want people to know, to know what they're dealing with. Yeah, it's a very important point. And, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. speaking to good stories too, um, you know, there were some signs mm -hmm. of hope, I think, this year among news. You know, we have, uh, you know, all the news about the diminishing sea ice levels, but it's variable from year to year. And this year mm -hmm. I read uh, that ice cover in parts of Hudson Bay lasted well into July, which allowed some of the bears in that population, some of the bears maybe that we're seeing on the polar bear cams this fall, that they, they could stay out on the ice for a few weeks longer than they had in the past. So how important are these events for the health of individual bears as well as like the overall population? Yeah, in, in the short term, it's great. Um, and, and that's a really important part, Mike. Uh, as we're kind of looking long term, we, we are looking long term. When we talk about polar bear populations ourselves, we're looking 10, 20, 30, 50 years in the future. Uh, but when we're looking short term, we are still going to see some good ice years. Absolutely. It's more the overall trend downward we're worried about. But this year was a good ice year. And those few weeks can make a big difference. In fact, when I mentioned earlier that the population has declined, um, that's because there's three to four weeks less sea ice than there used to be. And three to four weeks doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a big difference. So if you add that three to four weeks in the other direction, like this year, that's a lot of extra hunting for a polar bear. That could be a few extra seals, tens, hundreds of thousands of extra calories and many, many extra pounds of fat on their body that could help them uh, depending on when freeze up is this year. So in the long term, it doesn't necessarily support the population um, in a huge way, but it's definitely fabulous when we see a good ice year, it makes us happy for the bears. We hope they got some extra hunting in. We love fat, happy polar bears for sure. And the extra ice always helps. And with Katmai National Park, our partners at, at Katmai National Park, you know, we just got done with Fat Bear Week. So brown bears, again, at their fattest point of the year. So we're seeing a lot of fat um, bears on the landscape in, in Katmai. Um, and I think that bodes well for their reproductive success. We could have, you know, many new bear families coming back to the river next year. And, you know, you mentioned this uh, a little bit about this earlier, at least about how body fat is just so important for mother brown or excuse me, mother polar bears. And that's that's true of brown bears as well. There was a study out of Washington State University that found that female polar bears with less than 20% body fat at the time of denning, they don't give birth. So, you know, female brown bears need uh, fat, you know, to, to support the, the birth of their, their offspring and the growth of their offspring during that time of the year where the mother bear is still inside of her den and she doesn't have the opportunity to roam around the landscape and re-energize based on wild foods. Uh, so, um, you know, when you have these diminished um you know uh, years of sea ice for example how does that affect you know mother polar bears in particular uh, you know i think every any parent will say certainly my parents said it to me a lot and they still do <laughs> that raising kids is a lot of work uh, so how does you know how does diminished sea ice affect mother polar bears um you know and is that more maybe more pronounced for mother polar bears than it would be for like a large adult male yeah, we consider uh, mother polar bears and their cubs the most vulnerable bears in the population. And, and they're the most important, arguably. They're the ones that are contributing more polar bears to the next generation. So it's so important that mother polar bears have what they need. 
And when we see a loss in Arctic sea ice, um, well, they have less food to access. So this can make getting pregnant and having babies and supporting those babies and nursing them much, much harder. Um, and then if they can even get over that hump, you know, they're out there teaching their cubs how to be a polar bear. So they're teaching their cubs, okay, here's where you find a seal. Here's how you navigate sea ice. Here's how the sea ice patterns work. And then we are changing those patterns and we're changing the sea ice by the rampant use of fossil fuels that we have. And so what those cubs learn from their mom might not be what they experience as some adults or adults years later. The sea ice patterns in some areas are changing quickly. Um, the, the seal patterns could be changing. The, the sea ice is getting more, um, it's moving more than it used to because it's less thick in some areas. So things are changing so fast and you know, it's hard for moms to keep up. Uh, so it, it's really taking a toll on the reproductive members, the, the females of the population. And we know that females in Western Hudson Bay do have fewer cubs now than they used to. And those cubs are smaller than they used to be. So we, we are definitely seeing impacts of what changing sea ice can do to polar bear populations. Certainly brown bears aren't immune to changes associated with, with climate change either. Um, you know, right now for the bears in Katmai National Park, things are, do, they're, things are well for them. Uh, there's a lot of salmon on the landscape, and no matter how well we protect the landscape, you know, climate change, it's uh, sticking its fingers in the ocean through acidification, which is going to disrupt mm -hmm. the marine food webs. And that's already happened with other salmon populations in the North Pacific. Um, and it could, you know, disrupt the food webs that um, allow salmon to survive well in the sockeye salmon to survive well in the ocean, and that can have a direct impact on salmon runs. There could also be heat waves and things of that nature that disrupt the actual spawning events in the summertime. And then in other areas, droughts they can really impact berry abundance, for instance. And when bears have less wild foods available, they're going to, you know, maybe take greater risks around people. So I don't think we can forget, Elisa, that, you know, or, or ignore that, you know, these changes have consequences for people too. You know, it, when brown bears or grizzly bears are spending more time around communities, that's dangerous for the bears, it's certainly dangerous for people. And, um, you know, what about with polar bears though? How, you know, does, how, how, do, how do more, how, how do polar bears spending more times on ice have an impact on communities in, in the Arctic? It's, it has a big impact. Yeah, as polar bears spend more time on land, they are hungrier, they are not as healthy, and they're more likely to go into communities looking for food sources. And this is something we're going to be talking more about this fall. In fact, we have a couple webcasts dedicated specifically to that topic. Um, and this is part of some of the research Polar Bears International is doing as well. We are working on uh, human polar bear coexistence, particularly in Canada, um, but other areas as well. And also technology like our Bairdar that we're training uh, to detect polar bears coming into communities plays a role in that as well. So polar bears and people will have to coexist more closely uh, across the Arctic in the coming decades. And we are uh, very much aware of those issues and how we can be supporting those communities in the way they want to be supported. So we will absolutely be talking more about that this fall. And I look forward to that and also, you know, learning more about the technology that helps us to study polar bears and brown bears. Um, the, one of the, the, actually, maybe the final question I have for you, since we're just about out of time, and I want to thank everybody who mm -hmm. did submit questions in the chats today. Sorry that we couldn't get to them all. But, so, um, but I was wondering, you know, how uh, does the advances in technology help us study polar bears? Um, so you mentioned the, the bear dar, but you also mentioned basically the Velcro system, um, fur <laughs> on fur. Um, you know, how, how, how is technology helping us to uh, advance the study uh, of, of these amazing animals? Yeah, because polar bears prefer to live out on the Arctic sea ice in one of the most dangerous and harsh habitats in the world, it's really difficult for us to study them. This is why Churchill is such an amazing place to study polar bears. So we have all sorts of different technology. Tracking technology is huge, improving tracking technology to find out where the bears are going and when and understanding why. Uh, detection technology, we have a lot of different things on the go. And I really think that um, tech has allowed us to learn so much more about polar bears, what they need, how they're changing, and how we can protect them along with people that share their coastlines. So we have some really exciting things to share um, in, the, in the coming weeks for sure. And some of those bits of technology, I think also can be applied to brown bears. Maybe I would, I would love to see, totally. um, you know, the, the burr on fur tested on brown bears too, that maybe as a non-invasive way to track some of their movements. Um, so mm -hmm. potentially that could happen in the future. And then also I know there are people working on 
uh, artificial intelligence, working specifically mm -hmm. on facial recognition technology for brown bears, because brown bears, their facial features differ a lot more than polar bears. Um, in sure. like the the size and the shape of the ears, um, the 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 roundness of the face, um, the shape of their muzzles and things like that. So artificial intelligence may help us to track bears across landscapes in the future. And I think that's something that is a, a bit of a fascinating aspect of, you know, the, of, of their, of the study of these animals going forward. Um, you know, we're coming up uh, uh, on about an hour now, Elisa, in our conversation, and it's been a lot of fun, but I just have one final question for you. What can we expect to see on the polar bear cams and buggy one uh, this year? Yeah, every year is a little bit different, um, but expect to see a lot of cute sleeping polar bears. Hopefully we'll see some moms and cubs coming through. When the snow falls, we often start to see some sparring, which is play fighting between usually the males. That's always a lot of fun. Uh, there should be an Arctic fox around or two, hopefully, or some red foxes. Uh, some hares and just bears being bears, which is our favorite thing to watch. So we've seen some really cool stuff over the years and hopefully this year is the same. And we'll be there every day to answer questions and you can look at the schedule of our live chats and webcasts on either explore.org or polarbearsinternational.org. And we hope to see you more this fall and answer uh, a lot more of the questions we couldn't get to today for sure. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great season um, to watch and learn about polar bears. And again, go to polarbearsinternational.org if you want to learn more about those amazing animals and the organization. It's When I have a polar bear question, it's basically the first place that I go to see if it's on that website. Often it is, and then I can <laughs> I can go from there. Uh, so yeah, you can if you want a, a shortcut directly to the polar bear cams on explore.org, go to explore.org slash polar bears. If you want to watch mm -hmm. the last of the brown bears fishing for salmon at Katmai National Park in Alaska, go to explore.org slash bears. And as we conclude here, you know, just some final thoughts from me, Elisa, is that you know, polar bears and brown bears, they're they're driven, both both of these animals are driven by a profound hunger. Uh, they build body fat that fuel their survival during times of prolonged famine. And that body fat also helps, you know, bears reproduce successfully. Um, you know, female bears need that energy to feed their cubs when no other food is available. They're intelligent, they're individualistic animals, they're tough animals. These two animals and these two populations, whether it's in Katmai or in in in, uh, in Manitoba, they show us really stark contrasts in the lifestyles and adaptations of two closely related bear species. It also serves as a poignant reminder of the impacts that humans have on uh, these animals. Elisa, thanks so much for joining uh, me today, and, uh, but I know you have also some final thoughts to share. Yeah, I just wanted to encourage everyone to, I think Mike covered it, check out the website, check out us. We will be sharing a lot of great news stories this year as well, so we can answer any questions you have about polar bears. We'll be bringing up experts in different um, areas of polar bear science, and then we'll share ways that anyone can get involved, ways you can help us protect polar bears, uh, and ways to kind of impact society around us for a better future for us all. So thank you so much for joining today. And thank you so much, Mike, for hosting. We're really Hi, welcome to the last polar bear live chat of the polar bear. Hi, welcome.